cheese here. Mm, let's bring this up. Sorry, guys. I think something changed here. Let's try that. That feels a little better. Good morning, everyone. I look forward to the Sunday AM service as an opportunity to uh, dig into the scriptures together and to plot all kinds of thoughts and ideas. However, from time to time, practical church business does arrive, arise and need to be addressed here um, uh, and put out so we can get it out there to everybody. And this is one of those weeks. Um, our conversation will be different today, but my hope is that it will be uplifting and encouraging as well and scripture related. Um, but it is, refer it is connected to this nominating committee report that we published to you today. Uh, we need to talk about it because there is no doubt in my mind that understandable questions uh, may arise um, in your minds as you read it. And um, as that happens, it is my responsibility as your pastor to answer those. And I especially want to do that now, two weeks in advance of the annual meeting, so you have time to, to ponder what I'm saying here and then ask further questions between now and Sunday on the 25th. And the questions that pop into my mind that might be popping into your mind go like this. Why is the nominating committee ballot almost identical to the one last year, with the exception of the elders, which has changed? And about that, why is there only one elder up for nomination? And lastly, why don't we add more members? When you look on the back, there's only 15 names there. Uh, the church has actually been growing. You couldn't, wouldn't know this week, but uh, there's actually, in general, more people coming here. Uh, why don't we put more of those people on the membership roster so we can then, in turn, put more people on the nominating committee ballot? Um, this is kind of a more practical functional question, but it is re related to doctrine and scripture and practice, and so I want to kind of answer those questions and let you know what's going on in my mind. What gives? My plan is to address the eldership question briefly, and then spend the vast majority of our time talking about membership and why my brain, uh, or where my brain is on that, and why we haven't talked much about it over the past three plus years. So the first the question would be is, uh, why do we only have one elder? Uh, last year, we nominated two elders and elected them, both Nick Getchwinder and Val Matuskiewicz. Val's name is not on there this year. Uh, the, the answer is quite simple. Um, Val has a ton on his plate right now. He's going to school full time and he's working at EG Tax. And he's been finding it uh, challenging to keep up with all of the meetings and the reports and the responsibilities of eldership. And so what he and I have talked about is that uh, he's in a step back in the official capacity of eldership where you're elected and stuff like that. Uh, but we are going to appoint him at the annual meeting as an elder emeritus, which is basically an elder in a, uh, a more unofficial advisory capacity. So we're gonna retain his services in that way. And functionally what that means is that he's gonna be able to come and go as, as he pleases from the meetings and we're still gonna be able to have him on tap for advisement and such things as that, but he's not gonna be bound as much as he once was, so he's more free to pursue the things that God is, has on his heart right now. And uh, when, when and if that changes, we can bring him on in a full capacity at that time. And so that is great, everything is great, check with him. Uh, he will confirm that, but just so you know, there's nothing wrong there, everything's still good there. Um, also, the second question is, or the second answer is that with the membership roster being as limited as it is, there's really no one there on the roster that isn't already stretched in a, in a thousand directions already. Like I say, we don't have very many names on there right now. And adding this to anyone else's plate, as adding, adding eldership to anyone else's plate is not necessarily gonna be helpful. To be perfectly honest with you, I'm looking back at Nick right now, he is also stretched in 10 million directions and it's probably not the greatest for him to stay on. But you know, we, we kind of figured we gotta have at least one, you know. So congratulations, buddy. <laughs> Uh, but lastly, um, and I need you to hear my heart and understand what I'm saying, and again, ask the questions uh, later, 
here's my main answer, and that's, that is that we don't need to add another name to the elders board right now. We simply don't. And this is because the leadership team has been a ministry board, elder board hybrid for quite some time now, at least three, maybe even four years now. And what, what that means is, is that the ministry board, which consists of the ministry leaders, and the elders board, which consists of the elders, don't meet separately. They meet together in the same room. We have one board meeting a month. We talk about all the functional stuff of the church together. Um, we used to have a ministry board meeting and then an elders meeting, and the ministry board meeting would talk about all the stuff that goes on in the church, and they would make decisions because they're the ones doing the work, and the elders who were overseeing the spiritual stuff would weigh in and, and dictate things to them when we weren't even there, and it would cause all kinds of confusion and problems. And so long ago, we decided we needed to be more part of the conversation so we can be supportive and helpful to them, not a problem. And so we were already meeting together, and we still do that now. And the way the elders maintain elder authority in that environment in accordance with the bylaws is, is that the elders, though we meet uh, and have uh, just a normal meeting across a table with everyone, the elders do have veto power. And what that basically means is, is we maintain elder authority and that uh, if something happens that we feel as elders aren't, isn't, shouldn't be happening, we do have the ability to stop the conversation right there and, and veto what's happening. Um, however, uh, in the years that we have been meeting together, that has never happened, okay? And my point behind this, is to tell you that the leadership team is fine as it is. You have a plurality of competent, wonderful leaders meeting together on the hybrid board. You have two elders, which is enough in a small church, and you're not losing Val. Val is still around. He's just around in a more non-official capacity for a little while while he's going to school. So please feel free to bring your questions to me if you have further questions, uh, but that's what's going on there. And I published this information now, so you had time to process it and come to me if you can think of anything you need to ask, okay? But now that we're done talking about eldership, let's talk about membership here. Why do we only have 15 names on that membership roster? We could have more. There's lots of people coming to this church that come here regularly that aren't members. Why haven't we been opening it up? Um, the reason that we only have 15 active members at NAC right now is not because we have not picked up people. Uh, it's because we haven't added new members since 2020. And ever since the last exodus uh, during COVID, when I watched a whole bunch of new members walk right out the door again, right after they made a membership commitment, I just could not bring myself, try as I may, to do it again. I just couldn't. I tried. I tried. I even went through and tried retooling the membership series and just working through it in my mind, trying and trying and trying, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it. Why? Because over the years, and believe it or not, I'm somewhere... Am I in my 12th year now? I think I'm, yeah, this is year 12. I came here in, um, in 2012. So I've been here long enough where I can say over the years. Um, and over the years, I've been hearing a consistent message uh, from the congregation. It was always, we need more members. We need more members. And I stand before you and I can faithfully proclaim that many times I packed that roster full of members and we'd have people up here standing and making membership covenants and we'd get that thing filled out. And in almost every case, you had people who were doing great. We had a great relationship with them. And then once that membership thing came into play and they started taking more active roles in the church and stuff like that, uh, then the relationship soured and they were gone many times within a year, year and a half after that. And I never went back to actually count how many members I've brought in over the years, but it's a lot. It's a lot of them. But almost all of them that I've brought in over the years have left and they left relatively shortly after we brought them in. There are only a few exceptions. Chuck and Robin are one of them. Congratulations, you're one of the, you're the survivors. Luanna, where are you at? I saw you here. Luanna's another one. They're the survivors, okay? Um, did, you, did, did you come in under me? I thought you were already here. <laughs> Stephanie's a survivor. The other two survivors that are, uh, are, are here are Tim and Christine Pazanka. Uh, the rest of them have gone, okay? And again, relatively quickly afterwards. And so with this in mind, I have not been able to shake my apprehension of doing this same thing again, you know? And uh, we, we've got, we're in a great place again. The, the church has, has picked up. It's picked up a lot in 2023, especially. And you've got all these wonderful people that are doing well. And I just don't want to reintroduce something into people's lives that isn't going to benefit them. Uh, I've had this lingering sense that we've been doing this wrong for some reason. I have a lot of empirical data, which I've been sharing with you just now to prove that. And I really wanted to fix it. I wanted to get this right before we tried it again. So I've been soul searching, thinking, and that's why I 
just couldn't bring myself to do it. So to be clear, if I haven't been already, why aren't, don't we have new members? It's because of me. I am the holdup, okay? Um, and I appreciate your guys' patience with me as I've been kind of soul searching and thinking through this. But with that said, these are my thoughts on church membership based upon that period of soul searching, uh, which is basic, which I hope would to be informing um, how I uh, pursue and how we pursue as a church membership going forward. First, what I want to give you is a, a brief definition of the way I think membership should be happening, okay? And this is the definition here. What is church membership? What is church membership at Niagara Lines Church? What I believe we should be saying is this. Re uh, membership is a recognition of alignment with Niagara Lines Church in vision and in doctrine and in ethics and it is a commitment to general exclusivity with Niagara Lions Church, which renders a person qualified to serve in leadership at Niagara Lions Church, okay? So we'll say it again. It's a recognition of alignment with Niagara Lions Church in vision, doctrine, and ethics, and a commitment to general exclusivity at the church, which renders a person qualified to serve in leadership, okay? So that's some very quick things I want you to understand we're not saying here. And this is probably the part that we need to be more clear on, but I didn't actually put these up on the board for you. So just note this, this is what we're not saying. These are the things that membership, according to this definition, don't mean. Membership does not indicate whether a person is a believer or not, okay? You can be a believer and not be a member. Membership also does not indicate whether a person is spiritually growing or not. You can be healthy, growing, thriving spiritually and not be a member. And member does not indicate whether a person is suitable to plug into the body or not. You can get involved in this body. You can, get, you can do all kinds of stuff in this body without being a member. Membership is not required to spiritually prosper, to volunteer in activities, and to get involved here. What am I trying to say here? You don't have to be a member. You're not missing out on God's best just because you choose not to be a member. It's possible to thrive spiritually and to grow and to be in good standing with God and not be the member of a church. Can I say that and not get tomatoes thrown at me? That's what I'm trying to say here, okay? Membership in Niagara Lines Church, I believe, should primarily be about leadership, okay? What I'm saying here is if you want to lead and guide in this body, then there are some specific standards that we need to maintain that are in direct um, connection to leadership in this body. For example, we need alignment, okay, doctrinally, ethically, and based upon vision. And that's so that we're all who are leading the church are pulling the same direction and playing off the same sheet of music, all right? It's, it's totally possible to disagree doctrinally and disagree on vision and be Christians, but if we're all part of the same organization heading towards the same direction, there's going to be conflict, there's going to be problems, it's not, there's not going to be harmony if there's not alignment on these things, okay? So that's why we need alignment there, and membership facilitates that for leadership. Also, there needs to be some exclusivity as well, and we're not saying that a person can only go here and only believe what, exactly what we believe. We're not saying that, but we're saying for those people who are steering and guiding this ship, they need to be around more. Does that make sense? I mean, it's one thing for people who aren't leading it to, to go other places and do other things, and that, that's, that is what it is. You do what God is calling you to do. But for those who are leading this body, providing guidance and direction and oversight to it, you need to be around. And if you're not around, you're not gonna be able to do that. Is that fair? So that's what we're talking about when we say we need exclusivity, we need alignment for membership and leadership. But to be clear, one can disagree with part of our doctrinal statement, um, and one can attend Niagara Lions Church sporadically, and they can still prosper with God in general. All right? That's... That's a reality. I think it's a reality that we see regularly in people. Um, we see people that disagree on major things doctrinally, but they're heading towards Jesus, and they come here in order to pursue that, and they're growing. That's wonderful. Let them do it. Leave them alone. Let them do it. All right? And, and the same thing is true. Uh, there are some people that may, uh, they may align, doc or they may disagree doctrinally, but they're here a lot and they're growing. There are other people that are here a lot that disagree doctrinally. It, 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 it's, it's all great. 
It's wonderful. Uh, they're still prospering with God. But membership, we need those things just because there's a specific things that the leaders need. And with that said, here's where I believe we may have been misunderstanding things. Um, and I'm not saying that everyone here saw it this way. I'm not saying that I saw it this way. In fact, a lot of these things I've been speaking into for years now, but I think in general, in the evangelical culture, I'm verbalizing some things that have been kind of ingrained that I think we might need to unlearn a little bit, okay, regarding membership. Firstly, membership is sometimes viewed as a necessity for spiritual growth, as though there is, you know, coming to church, and then there is getting baptized, and then there's getting, becoming a member, and then there's becoming a leader, and, and, and there's this whole process, and if you don't check that box, you're missing something. You're not able to grow spiritually. You're not able to prosper with God without that. Um, and that is not necessarily something we, that is helpful. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that that's something we should be communicating. Uh, and I think we need to be very cautious about that for the reasons that I just talked about before. Uh, but more so than that, uh, membership is sometimes viewed as a necessity for service and involvement in the church. Uh, and there can be this line of thinking where people need to become members before they can be plugged in. And I know this line of thinking exists not only in the church, but for those on the periphery, because when people come in and visit, they often ask about membership because they're looking for how to get involved. And they just assume the only way they can get involved is by becoming a member first. I also know that this happens because for years, every time we would have a nominating committee meeting, oh, I just, I'm going to confess it now. I'm just going to be honest. I just, oh, it would just be so hard for me. Because we would, we would go down, we'd have this long list of names um, that, that were on the membership roster, and we'd be looking at something like the deaconess ministry or the steward ministry or something like that. And we'd say, who do you want to nominate? And then we would just start rattling off all these names, and we would just start packing uh, everybody we could into these committees. And the thinking behind it was, is, well, uh, it's a big job to be a, a deaconess, which it is. It's a big job to be a deaconess in the hospitality. Uh, and so we need to get as many names as possible on the committee. And I would try to say to them, you don't have to be a member and to be voted into a committee to do deaconess work. All we really need is a few people to lead that committee. And then you can go to the church and you can tap anyone you want on the shoulder and have them volunteer here till volunteer and help you. The same thing is true with the stewards ministry. I know I'm speaking for Nick right now. He would say, hallelujah, amen. We don't need 10 stewards to be nominated as members and elected to the office. All that's going to do is create confusion because you're all going to be trying to, you're stepping all each, over each other as you have these meetings and try to plan. What you need is two or three leaders to guide the ministry, and then you can just be free to go and tap anyone on the shoulder who is available to help and to volunteer, and that gets people on the periphery involved in the body. They don't have to be members. They don't even have to be believers to do that. And in fact, you can actually encourage them towards faith when they're unbelievers by getting them around a group of believers that are doing work on the church. Make sense? You don't have to be a member to get involved in the church. Also, membership is sometimes viewed as a means to generate spiritual disciplines in people. And here's what I'm talking about here. As we get on the spiritual growth track thing, you know, where you know you're, you, you come to church, then you get baptized, then you become a member, and such things as that. There's this thinking that goes along with it. This is a great way to uh, to instill spiritual disciplines in a person. You know, we can we can say, hey, you know, um, part of being a member is, is is being here consistently, and part of being a member here is is giving 10% of your income and and being you know and doing this and doing that and the other thing. And so now you're going to make a commitment to God to do these things, and we're going to hold you accountable. Okay, and they're not already happening yet, and it's well-meaning, but what we're doing sometimes is we're taking people who are not spiritually ready to make that level of commitment yet, and we're pushing them into it too soon, and they're making this commitment to God to do all these things, and they're not able to keep up with it, and then guess what? You made a commitment to God, buddy. You're not keeping your commitment to God. Next thing you know, there's guilt, there's shame, there's, there, there's all kinds of things uh, that are heaped on people that God doesn't want them to have because they made this commitment and now they feel guilty about it and such things as that. And I know that it's meant with the best of intention to encourage spiritual disciplines, but encouraging them that way sometimes puts people in a position where they feel guilt and that's not what we want to do, all right? Sometimes we do it that way. It's in, in, it isn't meant to be bad, but it's actually a form of coercion when, if we're not careful, uh, and we don't mean to do that. And this next one I'm going to say uh, is uh, it's the same concept, but it's worded differently, 
but I think it gets to the heart of some of what is the thinking behind this third one, and that is that membership is a means to generate volunteers and attendance and giving. You know, we got a bottom line here. We got to pay the bills. I need your money. You know, I need you, you to do stuff and that kind of thing. And uh, what a great way to do that is to get a membership commitment because there you're committing to God to give. There you're committing to God to be here. You're committing to God to serve. And, and it's a great way to coerce those things so that we don't. It's, 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 it's the common way to find your way out of that 80 20 principle where you have 20% of the people doing 80% of the work. You know, it's again not meant to be, I don't think we think it that way, but sometimes it can be coercion and it's not healthy. We want people to get involved, but we want them to get involved for the right reasons. We don't want to bring them into a commitment that they're not ready for and then hold them to it and heap guilt, guilt upon it, all right? And finally, for the above reasons, membership is often encouraged too early and it's often encouraged too forcefully, all right? Um, we're asking a lot of people to become a member. We are, we're asking people to align themselves doctrinally with the church. There's an 11 point statement there with nuances in it that we've talked about before. And we're asking people to be here consistently. It's a lot. In this day and age, Sunday isn't off for people anymore. There's stuff going on. We're asking people to make a major commitment to do that. It's a good thing to ask but we need to give people the time and we need to give them the space to make that commitment. Uh, we need them to desire to make that commitment for themselves. If we force them into a commitment prematurely, then it's gonna backfire. And I think that's part of what's been happening here. And that's why I wanna take this a little bit more slowly and a little bit more cautiously in the future. And so I wanna be clear again, membership at Niagara Lines Church should be required to lead at Niagara Lines Church, but we should not communicate membership in such a way that it is required to follow Jesus, because it's not. You're able to follow Jesus and not be the member of a church. He accepts you as you are. It's okay if you're not ready to do that yet. It's okay, all right? Now, those who do choose membership will be able to assume some special roles in the church, namely leadership roles like eldership, which we just talked about, and the ability to chair committees. It doesn't sound like, uh, I, when I say committee chair, there's something very um, organizational and sterile about that, but it's not meant to be. Um, it's a real honor and a privilege to do these things. Uh, those people that I sit down and perform leadership with on a monthly basis pastor the church with me quite literally. Uh, they are the ones that are leading and guiding the ministry activity in this church. And by doing so, they are influencing everybody here. They are setting the tone. They are the, pastor of, they are the pastors of this church along with me where I am not. Uh, and it's just, a, it's, a, it's a great privilege. It's a great honor. And it's a great sacrifice. And the same is true for those who aspire to teach. There needs to be more alignment. We need to be more careful about who we have teaching because, and preaching because there needs to be alignment there but also uh, the, just the general voting on policy and nominating and weighing those, th that's all stuff that members are allowed to do. Uh, and those are privileges that only members have and will continue to only have. However, there is a ton of things to do here that don't require membership at all. And you can do right now. Um, do I wanna open the floor up and say, what are some stuff you can do around here? There you go. All right. What's that? Okay. All right. So I don't have microphones I'm passing around right now, but working in the sound booth, you don't need to be a member to work in the sound booth. We'll take you. Yeah. Um, and, and you don't need to be a member uh, to, to serve at the, uh, the mission is what I was thinking. There's the, there's the mission, there's the fellowship dinner. There are general tasks around this building that need to be done, and it's not just cleaning. I see it back. What do you see as well? Yes, yes, absolutely fantastic example. Um, and we're, we're looking for more than that as well. Um, so, some of you here 
uh, are probably walking around this building and you can already see ways that we could make this building better. What's that? Oh, um, gotcha. Becca said mowing the lawn. Did I not say that? Okay. Yeah. So, yes, for those at home, you can mow the lawn without being a member. <laughs> but it's, we're not saying just those activities. We're also saying for you to walk around this building, there are people that walk up to me and say, you know what? There are ways that we can make this place better. If you walk around the kitchen, yes, absolutely. We can make the kitchen better. Um, there are ways uh, that you can, you, if you were to walk around downstairs in the children's ministry area, you would probably see all kinds of things that could be done to make our building better. Uh, you would have, you have advice or ideas of ways that we could things that we could take down and put up or ways that we could arrange things. There's just so much input that we need to hear from you. And we don't need you to be a member to say those things to us. We're listening. And we want your involvement in those things. What else am I missing here? Yes. Yes. You don't have to be a member to sing. <laughs> you can do that without being a member. And in fact, we really could stand to have a few more of you. <laughs> You've got a few people doing a lot there. Uh, we welcome that so much. What else? You got one, you got one Wendy? That's right. There's a lot of children's, children's ministry activity going on right now that we really, yes, it's so helpful. Wheatfield family picnic. I need someone to, to dunk in the tank with me. You don't have to be a member to be dunked in the, in the tank, as well as all the stuff that we're doing there. Um, and I know some of these se things seem mundane. Uh, they're not meant to be. Whenever we do these things together, um, as a body of believers, we grow closer to each other and we experience Jesus as we do them. And that draws us towards greater commitments. That's part of the growth process. Um, we're, we're, we're doing people wrong who come into this place if we tell them they can't get involved until they go through this hoop and that, this hoop and that hoop. Uh, we need to be a place where we can get them integrated, involved, just as it is. Oh, Janice, by the way, you should probably stay. That's right, uh, and visit shut-ins as well. Um, there's a lot of need there uh, that uh, has, and yes, did I say we need help in the nursery? <laughs> Um, probably should track Janice down. I don't think I have too much longer to go here. Um, I have a couple more things to say, but this is going to be one of those weeks that we're probably going to end a little bit early. But this is actually great. You're hearing it. It's informal right now. There's a lot of moving parts to this, even with a small church. And we're actually removing spiritual growth opportunity in people by requ requiring them to make membership commitments before they can get involved in any of these things. It is good for them. It is good for us to be able to get involved in those things now. And we really only need to hold that membership covenant for, for those who are entering leadership um, and for the reasons that we talked about before. Now, um, I want to review the membership definition again, and thank you so much. Keep thinking about the stuff we can do because we're probably going to mention this stuff again in a couple weeks as we encourage the people that come to this church uh, to get more involved, and we welcome them with open arms to get involved in the church. But our membership definition, again, is a recognition of alignment with Niagara Alliance Church in vision, doctrine, and ethics, and a commitment of general exclusivity with Niagara Alliance Church, which renders you qualified to serve in leadership. Um, this is the approach that I would like to go with a little, with a little bit more clarity going forward. Um, and with that said, there are going to be some short-term results that come along with that um, and some long-term results as well. Okay, so, so here are some of the results that we're going to see. First off, the membership, oh, did I say conclusion? Leave that up there for a second. The membership roster is going to continue to be smaller for a while. There's 15 names on there. Um, if we take this approach, that means we're not going to say, let's just do whatever we got to do to get all these people that are coming in on the membership role as fast as possible. Uh, we're not going to do that. We're, we're not, it means that we're not going to compromise on high standards, and we're going to ask them to meet those standards before they become lead members and therefore uh, step into leadership. Uh, that means that the process of growing the membership roster is going to be slower. However, what it also means long term is that our retention of members 
is going to be higher. It's not just going to be the Chuck and Robin and Luana anymore, and Stephanie. It's going to, we're going to actually keep more of the members that we bring in because they're going to understand and have worked through what they're committing to before they do it, okay? Also, it means that whenever we publish nominating committee ballots, there's going to be less names on them like there is this year. We're not going to be packing the, the nominating committee ballot with every name we can possibly put on, because we have the membership roster populated with all these names. We're only going to put enough names on there uh, as is needed to lead the congregation well. And more is not always better. Sometimes more is just more, right? With that said, there's going to be less names that you're electing, but the leadership will harmonize better and be more effective. Have you noticed that the leadership harmonizes well these days? There's really no feathers are not wrestling. There's no fighting. There's no problems. It's because you've got a, an appropriate amount of leaders that are all on the same page about things. And that's why things run smoothly. Uh, and that's what we're going to continue to do. We're not going to pack the roster with as many names as we possibly can because uh, we don't need to. They don't, not everyone has to be elected to be able to get involved in the church. Just the leaders do. There's going to be more harmony um, in leadership. And the leaders are going to be free to recruit whoever they want to from the body to help them out. And they're going to be encouraged to do so just as they always have been. You've heard me say this before. I say this to those who are in leadership and stewards or hospitality or whatever. Go to the church, tap people up on the shoulder, and recruit them to help. You can do that. It's okay. And lastly, coercion is not going to have any place in encouraging spiritual growth. Uh, we're not going to take a membership commitment, and we're not going to say, uh, you need to make a commitment to God to do these things and as, as a means to try to propel them forward faster than they're able to go. Um, growth in this environment will come via interaction with God's people as they are received into fellowship as they are. What does that mean? That means broken people are going to come into this body, we're going to welcome them, and we're going to include them into what they're doing just the way that they are, broken or not, believer or not, and in the process of them being with you, you are going to rub off on them, and they are going to be challenged, and they are going to grow over time in that way. Uh, rather than coerce or bind people, uh, we are going to inspire them uh, with clarity of vision that makes a difference. We are going to feed them with the word of God in a way that provokes their thinking, and we're going to serve them. We're going to remember that we are here to serve them. They are not here for us. We, when they come in, we're not going to say, oh, goody, more people so we can put them on the rosters and we can get their money. You know, we're not, we're, that's not what, they're not here to serve us. We're here to serve them. Does that make sense? And when we do it that way, they are going to prosper and we are going to prosper. It won't happen overnight but it will happen over the long run and it'll be very healthy and the community, the, the, community, the community that we will build will be very, very special and we will enhance lives with God's truth in the process. So with that said, I am going to open membership up again, all right, along this line of thinking. I feel more comfortable now that, we've been able, that I've been able to process through this. And so I want to encourage those of you who call this your church home and who are doctrinally aligned and want to get involved in that way to, to step up, and I'll make that path a little bit more clear in two weeks at the annual meeting. But know that you are not obligated and that if you're not ready to make that commitment yet, uh, we're not going to coerce you or force you, all right? We're just glad you're here. We are going to encourage you to get involved and, and, and be included in the body but to do so in a healthy way. Uh, we love you, God loves you, and we love you and God loves you as you are. And I want to encourage everyone here to say that to everyone who comes in. We love you as you are, and we want to include you into the kingdom of God as you are, and then God is going to change you and transform you as you are in, in, in part of the body. With that being said, let us pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, and we thank you again for the example that you've set. And we pray that um, everything that we do in this body, uh, that we would do purposefully and thoughtfully and in a way that makes people better and causes them to experience your gospel and your healing uh, fully and completely. And help us to be aware of anything that we might be doing incorrectly that might get in the way. Help us to do membership well. Help us to be a great year for us, where people are just blessed in every way as a result of being part of this body. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.